maybe he just needs a little while to put together an estimate. Well, they'll be there tomorrow. They'll be okay. in my house tomorrow. Okay. So maybe that's, uh, if not, when I hear the mowers start up, I'll go out and call her at him. Hey, <laughs> get back to her. Okay? Yeah, because it would be nice, you know, for him to have another yard up there, right? She planted the backyard, and I mean, it's, it's just a off, big huh? backyard. Exactly. You have a green thumb there. Now. Well, I mean, I want the. I, I just think back. I hear all the stories about how beautiful Goat Hill was, and I'm gonna do my part. Oh, you know? it was. It was a show place. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Well, the lady that lived in your home, which is Joe Latino's aunt, I think, she grew vegetables. Oh, oh my God! Even when she was as old as I am now, 80 some years old, mm -hmm. she still planted and watered. I didn't buy a cucumber or a green bean or a tomato or a kukutsa wow. uh, for 30 years. That's part of the Are we? We're live now, so we're going to start up on Okay. All right. So. Uh, well, to be continued. Where do you want me? Up on the stage, we're gonna go okay. up there together. Okay. Squeeze by you, sorry, you're good. How's it going? Good to see you. Thank you for coming out. Absolutely. I'm gonna sit down with you for a sec. Welcome back. Thank you. I more cheat sheets. Oh, I absolutely have to have a cheat sheet. I mean, this is different. Like usually I talk about history and it's more ad lib, but this is like, you know, a presentation of the story. So yeah. You're gonna do a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. You can elbow people if they start snoring. I want to welcome everyone back to The Dig. Um, this is exciting. This is the fourth edition of 15. Wow. And for those of you, I, it's fun to see familiar faces. I know some of you bought the series. Some of you keep coming back for more. Um, but the one thing and the motivation for this whole series, you know, coming out of the pandemic and um, the two things that we can do as a community is break bread and share stories. And um, Pueblo, I've only been in Pueblo 10 years. Um, sometimes it feels like 100 because the stories just keep coming and coming and coming. But um, Pueblo has such phenomenal stories that um, it just seemed appropriate to host in the Senate bar, um, which formerly there was a speakeasy here. And for those of you that have heard my talk on the prohibition culture, um, it really was extraordinary in that Colorado uh, went dry about four years before the nation did. So you tell a steel town, a blue collar town, that they're not going to be able to have beer or something after work. Of course, everyone's going to take it underground. So it's a phenomenal story. And so for us, this is kind of our speakeasy. And the other thing that we wanted to do is to actually broadcast live. So we have three cameras going. We are broadcasting live right now. And then they are actually archived. And um, each evening, and in particular last week with Peggy Wilcox's presentation, uh, she talked about 1870 like it was yesterday. Because we're still having some of the same problems that we had in 1870. But, um, we started, we're starting a pilot program with Central High School with the 11th grade um, English class. And we're gonna be doing uh, rhetoric, we're gonna do satire, public speaking, and we're gonna use these as tools. And so in addition to the recordings, the podcast, we're also going to be uh, publishing a book that'll be available for Christmas this year, for the holidays, and it's called The Dig, um, edition number one because next year we want to take the dig on the road. So we're going to go to four, I, I don't know how many neighborhoods, but we will go for four consecutive Wednesdays to a particular neighborhood in Pueblo. 
and we will encourage people to go and explore that neighborhood, to patronize the restaurants, and if we can really pull it off, we want to leave a new business in that particular neighborhood, whether it be a coffee shop, an art gallery, a store, something. That's just, um, that's a bigger vision, but um, it, it clearly is possible. So, um, and I have to say, um, for those of you, we have the whole team today, so Justin Brager is leading the filming, and for those of you that saw the Rocky Mountain PBS documentary on the Great Flood, Yes. So Justin and Sam Ebersol is back in the back. I, Sam retired, um, and I knew he would never retire. So we've got him coming in and helping and really giving us his amazing expertise and experience. So that is the team that did the Rocky Mountain PBS documentary. That's the quality that we want for each and every one of these presentations, because they will be used for future generations, and they will be used in the classroom. Um, and then we have to give a shout out to the whole Senate Bar family because they really are doing extraordinary work each and every Wednesday. So tonight, um, we try to work with a different caterer for appetizers, again, coming out of the recovery. Today, sadly, Pho Basil, which is what was my favorite Vietnamese restaurant, is closed on 29th and I don't think they're gonna reopen. So uh, Fa 50 in Pueblo West did the spring rolls and the egg rolls for us. So that's just another thing that we can do in terms of helping businesses because hospitality and tourism really were hit the hardest. Um, and then today we have a really fun new addition. So I don't know if you're familiar with the sacred bean, but this is a, a vintage 19, I don't know the exact year, but it's a VW bus and Vicki Stone, her husband, and the family operate these espresso machines and bake goods and sweets. And when you go outside, the bus will be parked just to your right. So if you want to get a sweet, um, by all means, do that. Um, it's, it's a great enterprise. So now I'm really excited. Um, I just met Mariana Gatto on the levee. Um, I think a lot of people met for the first time, or it was a, a kind of a re-invitation. But years ago, I worked with Google, with Google Arts and Culture, and I kept on reading these stories about Puebloans, Italian Americans and Italians, who left Pueblo and went west to Los Angeles and settled there. And we were chatting on the levee, and, and she said, well, I wrote those. And I said, you're Mariana Gatto? So it, it's funny how all of this is full circle. Um, but uh, an extraordinary story. Um, I'm going to read because um, I have just one eye. Um, and I don't have any debt perception. So uh, Mariana Gatto is the executive director and co-founder of the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, a historian and author with 20 years of experience in education, museums, and nonprofit leadership. Mariana began her career teaching high school in one of the most socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods in Los Angeles before becoming a museum administrator for the city of Los Angeles. In 2008, Mariana spearheaded a campaign that resulted in an allocation of substantial public funds to renovate the Italian Hall, the historic building in which the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, or IMLA, is located. She has served as the director of the IMLA since 2010. Mariana authored and curated the museum's award-winning permanent exhibition. She also raises most of the museum's major gifts, oversees events and programs, curates the museum's temporary exhibitions, and writes its educational curricula. Mariana's research focuses on Italian Americans in the West. Her second and forthcoming book is titled Beyond Little, Iti Beyond Little Italy. Uh, Mariana is also a contributing editor to the Italian Sons and Daughters of America's Journal and has consulted on and appeared in several documentary films, including the PBS series, The Italian Americans. Mariana is a frequent guest lecturer for groups ranging from the Department of Homeland Security to local universities. In recognition of her many years of advocacy on behalf of the Italian American community, Mariana was knighted by the Italian government earlier this year, awarded the Cavalieri degli Ordini dell'Italia, 
Knight of the Order of the Star of Italy, and that was a real <laughs> tragic bastardization, but um, one of Italy's highest honors for Italians abroad. Mariana's family settled in Pueblo in 1899, and although she was born in Los Angeles, visits to Pueblo were a frequent part of her life. In 2019, Mariana purchased a home in Pueblo, steps away from where her family once lived, and is proud to call the Steel City her second home. Without further ado, it's all yours, Mariana. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Am I live? Is my mic live? <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Are we adjusting the volume still, or shall I start? Yeah? OK, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, three years ago, when I first decided to return to Pueblo, uh, I knew no one here. And um, I figured I would carry out this quiet existence in the little home that I bought. Uh, but Pueblo is a city that embraces you, uh, that draws you in. And I've been so fortunate to um, have made a number of friends uh, since I've been here, uh, some of whom are present tonight. Uh, people who I've come to love, uh, people who I consider family. And uh, you can't say that about every town uh, or city in America. Uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, I feel Pueblo is uh, truly unique, um, really a gem. Uh, as a relative outsider, uh, I won't claim to have the pulse uh, of Pueblo, but I do see it as a city that's on the cusp of change. And um, this change will undoubtedly alter the face of the city, uh, and that's why I think events like this are so important. And I'd like to recognize Gregory Howell for putting this series together. Uh, <laughs> He's hiding at the moment, um, and doing more than his part to help showcase and preserve the history of Pueblo. Um, I also, again, you know, Gregory and I met on the um, the levee uh, on the the centennial of the flood, and um, want to thank him for asking me to speak tonight. So, uh, the piece that I'm presenting was originally titled "The Flood: The Story of a Family Heirloom on the Centennial of the Disaster That Begot It." Uh, however, when it was published on June 3rd uh, of this year, my editor changed the uh, title to something a little catchier. And um, it was written, I should mention, for a non-Pueblo audience. And uh, my editor shared with me earlier today that uh, to date there's been over 10,000 readers. So. All righty, so um, you're good advancing the slides? OK, perfect. So it's said that every family heirloom holds a unique and deeply personal story. The story of my heirloom, a late Victorian golden oak dresser, begins with a flood, the 1921 Pueblo, Colorado flood. Although the dresser figures in my earliest memories and more than any other piece of furniture has remained a fixture in my life, it was not until recently that I came to understand the enormity of the event, the tragedy that begot this most treasured heirloom. I first encountered the word heirloom in the second grade when my class was reading a story about a girl who had unraveled a family mystery by way of an ancestral quilt. Not only did I find the notion of heirlooms intriguing, the sound of the word itself enchanted me conjuring images of tintype portraits and jeweled lockets. We had nearly completed the book when my classmate Erin invited me to play at her house. Our conversation drifted to the story we had been reading, and as I came to learn, Erin was as captivated by heirlooms as I was. Do you have any? I asked in an excited whisper. Erin led me on tiptoes to the enormous china cabinet in her dining room and pointed to a large green and white vase on the top shelf. It's Wedgwood, she said, looking at me knowingly. A family heirloom that belonged to my great grandmother, she continued with the same snobby pretense that her mother spoke. Her mother's family, Erin frequently boasted, had come over on the Mayflower 
and the way she emphasized the word, it was as if Mayflower ended with an exclamation point. As I stood gawking at the vase, I imagined her ancestors, dressed in their finest pilgrim attire, passing the porcelain relic to a younger but equally ancient looking member of the family. It was one thing to read about heirlooms, but seeing one firsthand was another matter entirely. Admittedly, in the second grade, I did not know Wedgwood was synonymous with fine china, nor did I understand the implied superiority of being an old stock American. By contrast, my father's family had been among the huddled masses that fled southern Italy during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although my father had achieved considerable excess in his adult life, scarcity and want had defined his childhood. I had heard, though seldom from him, stories about his early years growing up during the Depression when his mother made meals out of vegetable scraps and fabricated undergarments from repurposed flour sacks. A horrible thought occurred to me in Aaron's dining room that afternoon. Had my father's family been too poor to even have heirlooms? What, if any objects, tethered me to the history, heritage, and experiences of my ancestors? Later that evening, after dinner, I cornered my father in his study, and wasting no time, I probed, Dad, do we have any heirlooms? <laughs> Fearful he would confirm my suspicion, no, honey, my family was too poor to have heirlooms. I braced myself. My father put down the book he was reading and looked at me quizzically. Heirlooms, he repeated. I stammered. You know, things that are passed down? He interjected. Well, sure, but why? What are you looking for? A sense of relief passed over me. We indeed had heirlooms. Much to my amazement, my father got up from his desk during what was his sacred, solitary time and beckoned me to follow. Motioning to the piece of furniture that stood in my bedroom, he said in the voice that he used when sharing something pleasant or awe-inspiring, your dresser has been in the family for many years. It survived the flood. The flood. It was an event so significant that it required neither a temporal or a geographic reference point. My father, who had been born in Pueblo and had lived there until the age of 13, had spoken about the Great Flood of 1921 on several occasions. He described it in such vivid terms that not only did it make me recall passages from Genesis, but I assumed that he had experienced the disaster firsthand. As I came to learn, the flood had predated his birth by more than a decade, yet the impact it had on his life was nonetheless profound. Pueblo, a city 150 miles south of Denver, sits on the floodplain of the Arkansas River. During the early 19th century, the river ran through the heart of town and demarcated the international border between the United States and Mexico. Then came the Colorado Gold Rush, and before long, the borderland, the borderland era gave way to the Gilded Age, a time when Colorado achieved statehood and the railroad connected Pueblo with the rest of the nation. The opening of what would become the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, or CF&I, or Colorado Fuel and Iron, I should say, or CF&I, in 1882, led Pueblo to become a national, albeit now largely forgotten, manufacturing powerhouse. For its industrial prowess, Pueblo, then Colorado's second largest city, was christened with the monikers Steel City and Pittsburgh of the West. CF&I, owned by John D. Rockefeller and railroad magnate John Gould, or Jay Gould, I should say, was the largest steel mill west of the Mississippi and a driving force behind Pueblo's economy. The opulent mansions of Ormond Avenue, the ornate commercial buildings of the Union Avenue Historic District, and the stunning Richardsonian Romanesque Union Depot, considered to be one of the finest railroad stations in the West, testify to the enormous wealth and stature that Pueblo had amassed 
by the late 19th century. The steel mill would also define the city's cultural fabric. CFNI, along with Pueblo's smelters, foundries, factories, and fertile farmland, drew many immigrants to the city, especially Italians, Slovenians, Mexicans, and Czechs. At its peak, over 40 languages were spoken at the steel mill alone, and more than two dozen foreign language newspapers were published in Pueblo. In neighborhoods like The Grove, three different ethnic churches could be found within a couple blocks. The city's Italian immigrants often hailed from the regions of Abruzzo and Calabria, but the majority, including my grandmother's family, had immigrated from a remote village in Sicily, Luca Sicula. So many Lucchese settled in Pueblo that the two later became sister cities. In 1897, my great-grandfather, Giovanni, excuse me, Giuseppe Cortese, and his 12-year-old son, Giovanni, left Luca Sicola for the United States. And like many Sicilians, Louisiana served as their port of entry. Giuseppe and Giovanni worked on a sugarcane plantation near New Orleans for a season, scraped together their earnings, and purchased passage for my great-grandmother, Vida Soldano Cortese, and her infant son, Antonio. Louisiana was only a sojourn for my grandfather, my great-grandfather. He never intended to remain in New Orleans. A padrone, or labor broker, working on behalf of CFNI, had recruited him and scores of other men from Luca Sicula to work at the company's main plant in Pueblo. The promise of well-paying well -paying employment in the steelworks coupled with the miserable nature of agricultural labor in the South, not to mention the region's volatile racial climate. 11 Italian immigrants had been brutally lynched in New Orleans six years earlier, ensured that my family continued West. By 1899, my great-grandparents and their sons had settled in Pueblo. And while accounts of their early years are nearly lost to history, every indication suggests they were exceptionally modest times. The family's first home was among the ramshackle dwellings that clung precariously to the hillside overlooking the smelter. The enclave's Italian families, who raised goats on the shale slopes, led the neighborhood to become known as Goat Hill, a name it still retains to this day. It was there that my grandmother, Maria Antonia Cortese, was born in 1901. Like many Italian Americans, I feel a profound, if not inexplicable, connection to the cities that served as portals for millions of our forebears, New York, Boston, and Pittsburgh, among other places. However, the spirits of my ancestors draw me further west to the coal fields, steel mills, and farms of Southern Colorado, a fascinating, though largely overlooked, chapter of the Italian diaspora. Imagining how my family survived Pueblo's freezing winters, scorching summers, and the influenza pandemic in a shack constructed from salvaged lumber with neither running water nor electricity never ceases to humble me. Within a few years of their arrival in Pueblo, my great-grandparents and their children had moved to a more dignified home in central Santa Fe Bottoms, another predominantly Italian neighborhood located at the foot of Goat Hill. In June of 1921, when the flood occurred, my great-grandfather Giuseppe was 67 years old and had retired from the steel mill. He and my great-grandmother had become property owners. Their eldest son, my great-uncle Giovanni, or John, had also left the mill and was a proprietor, or was the proprietor, of a successful barber shop on Union Avenue. My great-uncle Antonio, who preferred the more American-sounding Anthony, had finished his first year of dental school at Baylor University in Texas and was home for the summer. My grandmother, Maria Antonia, or Mary, who was then 20 years old, did not work outside of the home. A devout Catholic, Mary was known as a seer or clairvoyant among the women of Pueblo's Little Italy and was gifted in the folk religion traditions of Benedicaria. Nana Mary's family, who would adopt a more Americanized pronunciation of their surname, Cortese, 
felt a sense of optimism for the future, a sentiment that was shared by many Puebloans at the time. The Great War was over, the pandemic was behind them, and they were carving out their place in the United States. Puebla was also modernizing, improving its infrastructure, and establishing itself as a premier American city. <coughs> President Woodrow Wilson had recently affirmed Pueblo's prominence by choosing it as a site for an important speech in which he advocated for the United States to join the League of Nations. On the afternoon of Friday, June 3rd, 1921, a bank of ominous clouds filled Pueblo's western horizon and lightning flashed across the sky. Torrential rain fell in the center of town where the Arkansas River and Fountain Creek converged. North of the city, heavy pre precipitation also fell in the area of Fountain Creek, and as it flowed southward towards Pueblo, the creek continued to swell. But even as the storm intensified and parts of Pueblo re reported receiving more than 12 inches of rain in the span of an hour, a major flood seemed like a remote threat. The city, despite having received considerable rain during the previous days, was in the middle of a protracted drought, and the water level of the Arkansas was at a historic low. By the time Puebloans sat down to dinner that evening, the Arkansas River had neared the top of its bank. Steam whistles screamed out warnings, and as the downpour intensified, Hundreds of residents rushed gleefully towards the river and the bridges that spanned it to witness water as it sloshed across against the edge. There was little danger, they thought, as engineers had recently widened the Arkansas Channel and fortified its levees. In reality, conditions were growing more precarious with each moment that passed. Jubilation soon turned to terror when it became clear that the levees would not sustain the rapidly rising waters. And as word spread that the levees had already, been, had already started to collapse in some parts of the city. The crowd began to back away, slowly at first, and then in a great panic, running through the streets while dodging automobiles filled with frantic drivers and their passengers. Pueblo's telephone operators, including those who were not scheduled to work that evening, braved the perilous conditions, made their way through the inundated streets, and reported to their posts, joining their colleagues in sending out distress calls. The women contacted every subscriber they could reach to warn them about the impending danger while fielding calls from trapped residents. Even as the waters penetrated the lower floor of the telephone company building, the operators continued their work until telephone communications were lost, saving an untold number of lives. Meanwhile, the authorities, assisted by volunteers, including veterans, Boy Scouts, members of the local Elks Order, and others, raced to the city's low-lying neighborhoods, Pepper Sauce Bottoms, The Grove, Central Santa Fe Bottoms, where my family lived, urging residents to leave as a furious wall of water came crashing into downtown. My family had only minutes to act before the flood swept away most of the tangible representations of their American dream. Nana Mary managed to grab a handful of family photos, the only pre-flood photographs of the family that now remain. And she, her brother Anthony, and their parents fled with little more than the clothing on their backs. In parts of downtown and the low-lying neighborhoods, the floodwaters reached 18 feet. And while many residents managed to evacuate, Others would not escape in time. They did not understand or dismiss the warnings. The force of the water was so great, it disintegrated multi-story buildings, multi-story masonry buildings and bridges, tore houses from their foundations, uprooted 100-year-old trees, and ripped train cars from their tracks. When the floodwaters reached the, the power plant that evening, Pueblo was plunged into darkness. An eerie quiet fell over the city, followed by a series of explosions and the sinister glow of flames. With its rail lines and roads in shambles, 
and telephone and telegraph communications lost, Pueblo was cut off from the outside world. As dawn broke, the magnitude of the devastation became apparent. The flood had covered over 300 square miles and had carved the city into three sections. It had caused the equivalent of $300 million in damage, destroyed over 600 homes, and left more than 3,000 people homeless, including my family. Entire neighborhoods and business, business districts were re reduced to expanses of putrid water, mud, and rubble. Among the rescuers, the Grove, once a, death, a densely populated neighborhood, would be referred to as Death Lake, as it had been transformed into a vast basin, a catch-all for debris and the flood's human and animal casualties. Conditions are beyond description, the Los Angeles Times would observe. Refugees, clutching the few belongings they had managed to salvage, filled the streets and sought shelter at the courthouse, local churches, and in tents supplied by the Red Cross. Although prohibition had gone into effect 18 months earlier, and Colorado had been a dry state since 1916, bourbon was distributed to the flood victims for its medicinal properties. It's just water. <laughs> the National Guard also administrated vaccines to protect residents from typhoid and smallpox. And I think behind me, if you could go back to that really quickly, um, this is basically where we are today. That's the veil in their city hall. Okay. For many of the Italian women of central Santa Fe bottoms, the flood had stolen more than their homes and material possessions. It had also washed away the final resting places of their children. In an era of high infant mortality, families who lacked the funds to pay for proper cemetery burials often resorted to burying stillborn babies and those who had died during infancy in the yards of their homes. Over 1,500 people were initially thought to have lost their lives in the flood, but the true number of casualties will never be known. Many, many residents were single immigrant men who had no one to report them missing, while in other instances, entire families perished. The local paper often reported the deaths in the most simple of terms, colored family residing on the 300 block of Cedar Avenue. Some of the disappeared were never found, and many others were impossible to identify. As bodies overwhelmed the coroner's office and local funeral homes, scores of victims were buried in a mass grave at Pueblo's Roselawn Cemetery. Roselawn has created a memorial to those interred at the cemetery, whose names and identities were never recorded. When the floodwaters had subsided, my grandmother's family returned to the site where their home of over a decade had stood. And using long poles, they clawed through the mud, hoping to locate personal items among the wreckage. Submerged in the sludge, they found the outline of a piece of furniture. And as they raised it to the surface, it revealed itself to be a woman's dresser. The dresser did not belong to the family or any of their neighbors, however, so they placed it in one of the many lost and founds created to unite residents with their property. Days passed and then weeks, but the dresser was never claimed. The process of rebuilding Pueblo began immediately. Residents banded together and many city leaders would ass assert that within three years, the city had largely recovered. A return to normalcy would prove more elusive for my family, however, as there was no safety net or insurance policy to help them get back on their feet. Nana Mary and my great-grandparents moved in with their eldest son, whose Goat Hill home had been spared, and they brought the orphan dresser with them. Almost six months to the day after the flood, my great-grandfather Giuseppe died. His official cause of death was nephritis, or inflammation of the kidneys, 
but I suspect the trauma of the disaster and the losses it precipitated was a factor in his demise. The economic toll that the flood had on the family, coupled with her father's untimely death, was likely why my grandmother would not marry until a decade later, when she was 30 young, 31 years old, which was considered late for the time. Following her marriage to my grandfather, Calabrese immigrant Mercurio Ferdinando, or Fred, Gatto, not a Mary, <laughs> assumed ownership of the dresser. During the darkest days of the Depression, Nana Mary gave birth to three sons in a span of four years. My grandparents, their three children, and my great-grandmother resided in a tiny 700-square-foot home on Ash Street at the very top of Goat Hill. In 1946, Nana Mary turned to my grandfather and with great conviction said, there is no future for our boys here, Freddie. We have to move to California. My grandfather stared at his massive, calloused hands and nodded his head in resignation. After being laid off from the steel mill, he had gone to work for the WPA. But when, empl when employment was scarce, Grandpa Fred had resorted to riding the rails from city to city in search of an honest living spending months at a time separated from his wife and children. In the summer of 1947, my grandparents and their children packed their few cherished possessions, including the dresser, and bid farewell to Pueblo. Los Angeles, then a city where the heady essence of orange blossoms filled the air, would be their new home. And, uh, if we could go back to that really quickly, you probably see all the names, but um, my grandmother is on the far right, and my dad is right uh, in the middle here, my grandfather. Uh, incidentally, the woman on the very far right and the very far left, uh, they're both still alive. They live in Los Angeles, and they're in their 90s, my cousin Sylvia and Vida, and um, my uncle Frank and uncle Dominic are both uh, still with us as well. Upon Nana Mary's passing, my father inherited the dresser, and when I came to occupy my own bedroom around the age of four, he passed the dresser down to me. From an early age, I knew the dresser was older than the rest of my furniture. It was also unlike anything my friends had. I would admire its serpentine front and wonder how the dresser's fabricators had made the, wo the wood curve and undulate. The dresser also fueled my imaginative play. I would often sit, uh, remove a drawer, empty its contents, and sit down inside of it. It would become a car in which I would pick up imaginary friends, or a boat that carried me to distant lands. We didn't have television in my house. <laughs> when I was very young, I would stand on my tippy toes in order to see my reflection in the dresser's smoky cheval mirror. Buried deep in its drawers, I would hide my most precious belongings. For more than four decades, the dresser, like a steadfast companion, has reaffirmed my sense of self and helped span the psycho-physical divide. It has provided a reflection of both the internal and external and stood witness to moments both seminal and quotidian, as well as a panoply of emotions. At age six, I peered into the mirror and with great delight discovered my first loose tooth. <laughs> as an adolescent, during what I refer to as the two and not enough years, I stood in front of the mirror filled with self-loathing after having decided my physical self was incompatible with the cultural ideals and standards of beauty. I can still see myself in the mirror 27 years ago capturing the first glimpse of myself as a mother embracing my newborn son. I recall taking a final glance of, my, of, of myself as a single woman before leaving the house on my wedding day. The Great Flood of 1921 is, is widely regarded as among the most deadly in Colorado's history and is perhaps one of the most deadly in the nation's history. A century later, Puebloans still refer to the cataclysmic event, just as my father did, as the flood. 
Whether you're conversing with a nonagenarian or a millennial, every Puebloan knows of this defining tragedy and, us and usually has a family history to share. Not unlike the stories of Noah and Gilgamesh, Puebloan flood narratives speak of resilience and perseverance in the face of life forever altered. And in my case, they also tell the story of an heirloom. Thank you. time and time and again, but when someone explains them and they explain them through their own personal experience or their family's, you know, tales or fiction, it really transcends so many different things. But every time I enjoy, it adds another layer to those photos, because I know many of us have seen those photos many times, but everyone adds a little bit more to that whole storytelling. Does anyone have any questions? I know Mariana's going to be around um, afterwards, so um, do we have a rate? Yeah. Tell us about Mariana's family and what they're doing today. Um, let's are you see. Have, you're on your, you're on your mic. Oh, I've got my mic on. My family. Um, so are we we're talking about my immediate family or the folks who lived here in Pueblo? Immediate family. Immediate family. Uh, well, I'm one of three children. My sister is an epidemiologist so that she studies epidemics, not skin. And um, <laughs> um, my brother is uh, an attorney uh, who was uh, formerly uh, an, an elected official. He was formerly in the California State Senate. Excuse me, California Assembly. Same difference, you know. <laughs> um, I think that pretty much covers it. My son is uh, just finished graduate school. He's, uh, he majored in urban planning, and he's very interested in historic communities, including Pueblo. Um, yeah, that's... Tell them about what you're doing with the house. Since oh, which is amazing. so uh, in 2018, I bought a little house um, at the top of Goat Hill. Uh, I tried to buy my father's old house, but I couldn't, so... I bought one about four doors down, and it was a condemned property that was occupied by squatters and about 30 feral cats. But I said, that's the house for me. And um, so uh, over the past uh, couple of years, I've been renovating it. And uh, my neighbor, Kathy, told me she approves of the landscaping. So that's always good when you make friends in the neighborhood. But um, I love my little house, all 690 square feet of it. Uh, and um, it's just fantastic to be here in Pueblo. Oh, so after, you know, I get a little more work under my belt, um, I, I think Goat Hill deserves its own marker, you know, like welcome to Goat Hill. What I have in mind is a goat that kind of welcomes people at the bottom of City Center Drive as you're going up the hill. You know, it's really important to create a sense of place for neighborhoods, so um, that's more or less what I have in mind. <laughs> I don't know, Joe, what do you think? <laughs> do we need a goat? That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything that you said in terms of Gold Hill and the history that exists there, you know, like you moving across the street, where, you know, Benny lived at one time, and my aunt and uncle at Montanero lived there, and, and all those people were raised, they were very close, you know, that's, there's a lot of history there, and uh, to have you there now, and, and it's, just, it's just a blessing. Oh, well, thank you. Know? you. And you were talking about the furniture, I'm, I'm thinking about the sewing machine that my grandmother had. Mm -hmm. that we have, and, mm -hmm. and, and how they lived, and how they cooked outside in the summertime. They had an outside kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, and I think about the, the goats and the chickens, and, 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 and the, and the uh, wonderful gardens that they had. You know, Jimmy and I talk about that all the time. You know, there's wonderful history there, how everybody got along, you know, ethnically diverse community. Absolutely. Uh, not only with Italians, but there were a few Irish and absolutely their doors. Yep. Nobody closed their doors. And if I screwed up at somebody's house, uh -huh. they call my parents 
<laughs> well, here's to making a lot more history on Goat Hill. And uh, elsewhere in Pueblo, for that matter. Kathy. I am from Africa. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you to Maria Nagato for your presentation. <laughs> Next Wednesday, um, we're really fortunate. Uh, Maria Tucker, um, if you, we, we, I miss Maria because I would go to the third floor special collections and genealogy department in the library. And um, she was just like always there. She now is in charge of the Santa Fe Library, but it's her mother's 80th birthday, and she's going to be doing the presentation next Wednesday on Andrew McClelland. Um, another story that I don't know much about other than the buildings, and um, so it'll be a nice story, but Maria's going to be driving in for a few days. So that's next Wednesday. So if you're interested in Maria, uh, be sure to get your tickets. And um, we'll be around afterwards, so if you have any questions, thank you again. <laughs>